Are you ready? I'm ready. Clap sync. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Hello and welcome to a scrumptious edition of the Broken Speaker Podcast. My name is Greg and I am joined by my co-host and brother, Brian. Today, in fact, we have a rare opportunity to be recording together in the same place, since we are both in Michigan right now. Because of this, we've decided to try something uh, incredibly unique. Yeah, Greg, we are going to transform the Broken Speaker Podcast today into a culinary podcast, just for today. Yes. Maybe if this works out well, well, we'll do this again. But for today, we're going to attempt to bake chocolate lava cakes throughout the course of the show. Neither of us have done this recipe before. Nope. So either by the end of the podcast, we'll be chowing down on some sweets or laughing at what we've created. It's going to be exciting, full of deliciousness, and there might even be some heartbreak depending on how this goes. Now, if you're anything like us, you're probably going to be drinking a beer whenever you step into the kitchen. Um, now, that is, of course, if you're doing baking or cooking. Usually you have a beer while you're grilling. But, right. yeah, okay. Either way, regardless, we're not going to be changing that tradition, and today we do have a couple of beers. So, Brian, tell us what you're drinking today. So, Greg and I actually got to go to this brewery yesterday, um, and I really enjoyed the other beers on tap that they had there, but I decided to go with one beer I did not try, and it's called The Hef. Uh, and I want you guys to all imagine this right now. There's a little douche hound, I think is what they call it, but it's a wiener dog. A dachshund. Dachshund, dachshund. Um, and it has on a red and black smoking jacket with a uh, tobacco pipe, uh, kind of like a Sherlock Holmes looking pipe. Uh, uh, it's the late Hugh Hefner. It's the late Hugh Hefner yes. in, in dachshund uh, uh, styling. So it, it looks... The, the, the marketing is really what got me here. I thought that that was an incredibly clever uh, Hefeweizen uh, marketing scheme. So uh, it's 5.2% alcohol by volume, 13 IBUs. Um, and I believe when we were in the brewery, it got an award in 2016. That's what it said, yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm really excited to try this one. Uh, we'll, I'll let you guys know how it tastes towards the end of the episode. But Greg, what uh, what are you drinking today? All right. I've got a can of Bell's Brewery, Larry's Latest Sour Ale, which is a kettle soured ale with a dry hop burst. And the, I guess, graphic on this can here is the reason I bought it. It's very bright, colorful, um, and I've never had a real sour ale that I can think of. But uh, regardless, so this says their, their latest recipe has a refreshingly bright citrusy tartness combined with pungent tropical aromas and it's very difficult to read because the colors are very bright <laughs> but either way so uh i guess i'll give this a shot and let you all know how it goes you know what that that can kind of reminds me of two things one it reminds me of austin powers very 70s looking graphics yeah, retro the yeah. other one is uh who who was the artist that did the campbell soup can uh, the famous, like, artist from, like, the 70s that did, like, the Campbell's Soup Can and, um, oh, shoot, what is his name? Dude, he was in Men in Black. I don't have his, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol. I got it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but anyways, it kind of looks like it might be an Andy Warhol kind of, like, inspired yeah, art. Yeah, I, I can um, see that. But no, it's it definitely, I would pull that off the shelf if I saw it. Mm-hmm. All right, so we'll definitely give these a shot and let you guys know how they are at the end of the uh, podcast. But now... Since we are baking something, I hear you have some information for us, Brian, regarding what we should be drinking with what we're baking today. Yeah, and you know, this is kind of uh, a rule of thumb for, I'm not really a rule of thumb, but what we're going to talk about is going to be able to apply to anything that you're cooking or anything that you're baking. So before this podcast, I hopped on the Brewers Association website, and they have a quick little pamphlet that you can download and take a look through. And this might be helpful next time you're trying to figure out what to pair with what you're cooking. And the Brewers Association, what they call this, is a three-step can't-fail guide to matching beer with food. 
So the first step is to match strength with strength. So you don't want something with really strong flavors matched with something with really weak flavors, whether it's the food or the beer. You want to have something similar flavor strength. Um, they don't really say how to gauge strength, but that's up to you to decide. The next is to find harmony. So if you are, for instance, let's say that you are making a uh, coconut cream pie or something. Yep. A coconut milk stout might be the perfect pairing for that that beer mm -hmm. uh, or that, that, that cream pie. So you can choose whatever you'd want, but look for similar flavors or similar flavor characteristics in there. Uh, the third step is going to be consider sweetness, bitterness, carbonation, heat, which is spice, and other richnesses. Uh, so really what you're doing, and, and I think the culmination and what I've learned over uh, time is that when you're pairing beer and food, you just got to try it out. If you think that it might work out great, try it. Uh, I've actually noticed that you know, a lot of people say drink like a lager for <clears throat> spicy things like hot wings or something like that. I actually enjoy Hefeweizens more with spicy foods. Okay. And so it's a trial and error thing. All right. So so from our current selections, we have a sour ale and a Hefeweizen, which neither of those really go with chocolate lava cakes. Am mm -hmm. I right? Okay. No, no. <laughs> so according to the Brewers Association, so the same PDF that I downloaded, they've also got a list of 18 different beer types, some of their characteristics on there, as well as suggested foods, suggested cheeses, and suggested desserts. Um, so according to this, the ideal uh, beer to pair with a chocolate lava cake or similar cake would be an Imperial Stout, which neither of us have Imperial Stouts today. So that was kind of poor planning on our part, but I still... Well, th I mean, we, we always try something different. If we both had an Imperial Stout, it would be kind of boring, right? Right. And, okay. you know, I, I, I'm i really excited about both of these beers, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but, yeah, let's, uh, let's hop into the cooking portion of this show, because we've got a little bit of uh, work to do, don't we, Greg? Exactly. I've actually started... To boil the water. Now, the first part of this is to actually make the, the ganache, the chocolate ganache. The ganache. <clears throat> and so... To ganache, that, ganache sounds like such a fancy word for does. anything chocolate. Yes. yes, it does. But the first step, what we need to do, which I'm trying to set up right now, is we need a double boiler to melt a bunch of chocolate. And so, <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. And Greg, Greg, for the people listening, uh, what is a double boiler? Because this is this is a very interesting podcast. We're gonna have to describe what we're doing a little bit more. But Greg, how how would you describe a double boiler? So you don't there, there's special equipment you can use for this to make an actual double boiler. It's really just removing the what you're trying to melt from direct heat. And the way we're doing that is we have essentially a saucepan, high walled saucepan which is full of water, and it's gonna, we're going to bring it to a boil and then kind of let it simmer and keep the heat there. So the heat's in the water. Um, and then we're going to put basically a glass dish sitting on top, resting inside the pan, and it's going to, that's going to be where the chocolate's going to melt, inside that glass dish. So it's kind of like a science-y way to remove the chocolate from the heat, because if you put too much heat into a lot of this baking chocolate... It uh, it burns. It doesn't melt. It burns. So and, and we don't want burned chocolate. No, we, no, that won't actually work. That will be the end of the podcast if we burn the chocolate. <laughs> yep. So we need to. We're, we're trying. We are, again. Greg and I have never made a uh, chocolate lava cake. So there's going to be a lot of trial and error through this. And what we end up with might not be a chocolate lava cake. No, it's going to be a chocolate lava cake. It's just going to be our chocolate lava cake. It's going to be our chocolate. You know what? This is all up to interpretation. So if you try to make a chocolate lava cake as well uh, with this podcast. Which we're, we're going to put the recipe alongside the post we put on the, the blog and where we got all the stuff. So. Right. So, so you guys can try this out at home too. But just remember, it's all up to your own interpretation of what a chocolate lava cake is. Exactly. All right. So, first steps first, Brian. We've got four ounces of chocolate here, and we're going to break it into pieces into this glass dish, and then stick it on the double boiler and melt it. That's the first thing we got to do. It might take some time, but hopefully you guys are picking up the wonderful sounds of chocolate breaking, and you're getting nice and hungry and trying to drink an Imperial Ale alongside Imperial a podcast. Imperial Stout. Imperial Stout alongside a podcast. Okay. <laughs> there we go. So we got four ounces of that there, and we're going to put it on the stove. 
Are we only gonna do? Are we gonna do four ounces total, or just four ounces for the ganache? This is just for the ganache. So the the recipe calls to make the ganache first, and then we're gonna freeze that. Poor planning on our part because we could have frozen it first and then had it magically appear out of the freezer. But regardless, we'll take a break. We'll talk about some stuff while it's freezing. No big deal. So Brian, I'm gonna give you the spatula. I got the spatula. Go stir the chocolate. I am stirring the chocolate on top of the boiling water. Um, so far, it is. Oh nope, it's starting to melt now. Okay. So it melts pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. While we're okay. Doing that, Greg, what are what are you? What? How did you come up with this whole idea? All right. So the reason we're doing this is I watched a YouTube video. That's that's the essence of it. I watched a YouTube video of some guy called Binging with Babish, and he cooked with some John Favreau and another chef. And they basically cooked molten lava cakes, and it looked absolutely delicious. And I was really inspired to actually do it myself. A lot of the time, what happens is I find recipes online, I watch them, I look at them, and then I think, oh, that's easy, I can do that. And then I try to do it myself, and I mess it up gloriously, and then I never do it again. But regardless, I still try. And with the internet age and a lot of the uh, content that we devour, I mean, realistically, there's hundreds of recipes online that we can find at the touch of a button and it's super easy to do absolutely and i mean i see it all the time on instagram or facebook they've got places like uh or websites like tasty Uh, i see a lot of that or just in general you know people go out to dinner now and they take pictures of their food and the pictures look so delicious because of the quality of our cameras nowadays and you just want to have that at home. And sometimes you don't want to have to go out to a, a restaurant to uh, get that. So, yeah, no, I, I think that that's, that's really a way that um, people in our generation really consume uh, or think of different foods. It's not so much about, you know, what our grandmothers used to make or um, what our moms used to make. We still do that. We, we still... get recipes from our parents all the time and I try to make them. But it's more of like, you know, we see something like this chocolate lava cake online and we're like, you know what? I want to do that. And the crazy thing about this is because of the online era, Greg and I have never made a chocolate lava cake. We've never, you know, done this. And this kind of seems like a little bit of an advanced culinary technique. But we were able to look it up online and it really seems kind of simple. Well, I wouldn't say simple. I would just say it seems like we can do this. Okay, we can do. We this. have the ability to. So it's it's making uh, a ver- wide variety of dishes more accessible to us. Um, and so Greg has taken over on the chocolate right now. Um, he was. He, I've never I've never cooked on a gas uh, burner in Colorado. We've got all just kind of the electric. So adjusting the heat's a little bit different. So Greg, Greg has more experience on the stove right there. Yes, this is my domain. This is Greg's domain. <laughs> so Greg, Greg has taken over, um, and that's why you know we're, we we worked really hard on trying to set up this audio for this podcast. So this you know, might hear our voices get a little bit distant or a little bit closer. We're trying to stay close to the microphone, but because we're doing it live, we're doing it live. <laughs> we're trying this, but this is this is all this is a test. This is a this is new for us. No, but this is exciting. This is a the next, possibly the next evolution of Broken Speaker Podcast. Okay, Brian, the next step. I okay. need to take that heavy whipping cream. Okay. Get the one half cup and okay. measure it out. One half cup of heavy whipping cream. Exactly. I got, I got one half cup of heavy whipping cream. Opening it up and let's see. I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, better because I'm not doing it. You know? Okay. One half cup of heavy whipping cream. Okay, I need you to pour that in slowly. All right, pouring it in slow. We're about to pour it in slowly. It so very slow. Just drizzle. Yeah, just okay. like that. Just like that. Okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. We were, <laughs> there was a slight concern there for a moment because it looked like it was solidifying, but uh, it was just the cool whipping cream. It was the cool whipping cream. So um, that is what, what. What do we have to do after that, Greg? Once a uh, once we've got the heavy whipping cream and the chocolate kind of mixed together. Uh, we're going to freeze this. Okay, this we're gonna... is going to be the molten part. Oh, that's the molten part. So we're going to freeze this so that we can scoop it into our lava cakes before we bake them. And then it'll melt in the middle. And because it's frozen, it'll be a different consistency than everything else. Okay. So that's essentially all we're doing here. Let me just make sure this is all thoroughly combined and melted through. There. Yeah, no, it looks, it looks delicious. It looks like... 
melted chocolate. That's all it is. Greg. A little bit, a little bit richer. Um, so, oh, Greg, did we have to add the grand marinara? No, that's in a different part. That's in a different part. Okay. So, sorry, I'm getting my ingredients mixed up. Greg, Greg has this recipe. Greg has done more of the research on the recipe. I am Greg's helper. I'm his sous chef. Yeah, today. we got four hands in the kitchen now. That's four hands in the kitchen. Yeah, no. So we're. I mean, this is fun. This is this is adventurous. So, uh, but yeah, so we found this online. We kind of looked at it, but I mean, I've even you know past like baking. Um, I've looked at uh, people grilling food um, or you know you know cooking stuff in the oven. There's a lot of stuff that people are trying to make it accessible to people who run on a busy schedule. So I really think that the Instagram, Facebook, um, I guess a lot of things are on Pinterest. I don't do Pinterest. I but, don't do Pinterest either. Yeah, we don't do Pinterest, but <laughs> I've heard of Pinterest a lot. Uh, I've actually had some, uh, I, I've eaten some things that have been off Pinterest. Uh, and if you guys read our uh, Super Bowl episode, uh, I believe I called her Becky. But Becky always finds that Pinterest item uh, for buffalo chicken dip, and yeah, no, it's uh, it, it doesn't always turn out the way that it should, right, Greg? Right. And just give me a second. So Greg's putting the ganache into the freezer right now, and that is step one. All right, I guess that's step one. Okay. So so far, so far, nothing's been lit on fire. Nothing's on fire. Uh. Nothing's been dropped or broken, and we followed the instructions. <laughs> so that's I, the best we could ask. For. I'm saying that this is sort of a success so far. Exactly. So, uh, but what I was saying is that I've I've uh, had some stuff on from a uh, video or a picture online before, and I kind of wanted to share this story because this is kind of how uh, social media can oversimplify or make things look more delicious than they actually are. So mac and cheese. I, you know what? I know it's more of a children's dish, but it's simple. You make it out of a box, make it out of a box. I love mac and cheese. Mac and cheese is great. I had an ex-girlfriend who she decided that she wanted to take mac and cheese and hot dogs to the next level and wanted to try something different. So she found a Pinterest or a, a picture online describing someone who did mac and cheese and hot dogs, but with spaghetti. And what they did was they, they cut the hot dogs up into slices, stuck spaghetti through it, cooked the hot dogs and the spaghetti, just like you would cook hot dogs and the macaroni, and then put the cheese sauce uh, on top of it. In theory, and by looking at the picture, it looked really good. And I was excited. However... It did not taste or work out any way like it looked online. So that was a total fail. So you kind of have to be careful about what you pick and choose online and how uh, uh, what you actually make. Well, now, Brian, the beautiful word picture you just painted me there. I did not at all in any way, shape or form think, oh, that sounds delicious. It sounds disgusting. It sounds like what you're not <laughs> supposed to do with spaghetti and Hot dogs. Well, I've never done it again, and I've just stuck to the regular Kraft mac and cheese and hot dogs, because that is tried and true, and I've never messed that up in my life. Well, so Okay, there we go. So, uh, but yeah, Greg, have you ever tried to do something from online and it didn't work out exactly the way? Can you think of anything? Maybe, maybe uh, we can put you on the spot here. Okay, so online, this, this is roundabout, but uh, similar to the online cooking is something along the lines of Blue Apron. Okay. Where you have the food ingredients to, and the recipe delivered to you, and you're supposed to cook it on your own at home, kind of as a weeknight meal. That's the whole point of it. I signed up for that because I figured, okay, I live by myself. I'll get a bunch of recipes, and that's my grocery shopping for the week. I don't have to go to the store and pick up meats or veggies or anything like that. I'll just cook these recipes, and that'll be it. It'll be great. Now, it sounds great. It sounds great. <laughs> it sounds great. The recipes look good. Everything seems very, I don't know, culturally, culturally infused. And it seems like it's going to be perfect. But what happened was some of the dishes were great. Some of the dishes I could cook perfectly and they came out fabulously. And I've tried cooking them again. Some, some along the lines of General So's chicken. There was a pork roast once. 
that was really good. There was uh, Parmesan kale just as a side. The way they cooked it up, it was delicious. I, I loved the kale mostly because it was covered in Parmesan, but regardless. <laughs> so, you know, some of the recipes, they're absolutely good. But there were a few of them that I failed. I messed them up gloriously, and they basically sucked. So you can say half and half. It was good recipes and bad recipes. And it was a lot of... It was hard to say. It wasn't a bad recipe, or I couldn't tell it was a bad recipe. It was my cooking skills and actually getting in the kitchen and doing the work. And it was, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can blame it all on me. It wasn't Blue Apron's fault. It was my fault. Well, that's an interesting concept. It's, you know, you know, we, our mother, she taught us how to cook. We, we helped her in the kitchen quite a bit growing up, but we never were required to be in the kitchen and honestly we were really busy in high school with after school activities and stuff like that so uh i i personally never took any like uh cooking classes or anything in high school any any home ec classes or something like that um but uh a lot of our cooking came from when we got into college and it, you know we had to cook for ourselves now i was lucky and Greg, Greg and I both lived in the dorms our freshman year, so we got dorm food, which was very a, g a good uh, intro to eating on our own out of our parents' house. And the second year, I actually lived in the fraternity house, and we had a house mom who cooked for us. So we got uh, lunch and dinner five days a week, and then on the other on the weekends, I had a dorm pass, and I'd go over to campus and eat from the dorms. But uh, then Greg and I started living together. And that's when Greg and I started really experimenting. We, we would have, we'd actually plan out our meals a little bit, but that's really when we started learning cooking in the kitchen, mostly from trial and error. Now, it wasn't extravagant dishes. It was really just, can we cook chicken and teriyaki chicken? And then what else do we have with that? I don't know. So we would just have chicken. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's a lot <laughs> there of those. Was, there was a uh, chili dogs, which is a can of chili and a box of hot dogs or a thing of hot dogs. It's, it's not really cooking. It's just Don't forget pasta. Stuff. Pasta was fine. Was it was a jar of pasta sauce? And if then... we went crazy, we would do chicken Alfredo with the, chi the Alfredo sauce instead of the normal sauce. But it's all from a jar. So we're not making the sauce. I think I remember my, my worst moment of my cooking career at that house. Uh, one night... I know. I, if you don't say what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to throw you under the bus as the second worst. <laughs> so go on. So I attempt to do loaded nachos. Oh, that's another one. All right. We've got another one after <laughs> okay, this. Okay. <laughs> so we got, we got two. I, I'm, I'm interested to see what Greg remembers. Uh, but I attempted to do loaded nachos and I tried to melt Velveeta at too high of temperature along with uh, a lot of different toppings on a tray in the oven uh, with chips. And I had chips and beans and uh, I had uh, salsa and cheese and Velveeta. And uh, it was there was a lot of stuff going on in the uh the, the loaded nachos and it actually ended up it didn't melt the velveta it burned it it was really just like a plate of protein and cheese that was just clumped together yeah it was pretty bad but it, you it, did serve it up i tried and we tried to eat it yeah it was weird but yes yeah, so, so greg <laughs> what was what was my second the other one which i was adamantly against was when brian decided to make mac and cheese and then pour cornbread mix on top oh, and try I, to bake it. <laughs> I forgot about this one. I, thought, I was trying to make a cor I was trying to make a cornbread slash mac and cheese casserole. Yes. And I told him many times over, I hope you remember this, that you should look up an actual recipe and try it that way. But nope, nope. It wasn't good enough for him. He used a box of mac and cheese and a <laughs> box of cornbread mix. And just smashed them together and threw them in the oven. Yeah. It that, came out awful. Yeah, so, so. I was scarred for life. So. I could never do a cornbread <laughs> casserole in my life because of you. Okay. Well, the biggest problem is that the mac and cheese started to burn because it was already pre cooked. Yeah. Yeah. Mac and, and cheese isn't, isn't supposed to be cooked again, especially it, when it comes from a box. Okay. Well, it got. It started to burn, and I had to pull it out before the cornbread was 
made. So it, yeah, it was, it was a failure. Those are my two biggest failures of all time that I would say. Um, but you know what the thing is, is that you, you kind of see all these videos online and you want to create something. You, you, you kind of get inspiration from those. So I probably didn't see the cornbread mac and cheese on there or the loaded nachos, but, uh, I wanted to create something similar and I thought I had enough skill, enough experience in the kitchen to kind of put things together. But that's also why Blue Apron is kind of cool is because even without the skill, you they kind of teach you how to do it. Now, you might have to refine it a little bit, but um, it gives you kind of the guidelines of what you need to learn first. Now, because we are together, we can do this. This is very secret and special. I just went over to my, my cookbook corner, I guess you could call it. And pulled out all of the recipes that Blue Apron sent me. They give you a card. Some cards just explain the ingredients. But then they give you like a full page sheet of the actual recipe. Everything you need. Everything that they give you. And then on the back, it's the step-by-step recipe with pictures on how to make it work. For so, everything. So it gives you kind of a recipe card. So you could theoretically, without ordering Blue Apron, go to the grocery store and remake this if you wanted to. Yes, and that's what I've done on a couple of these. Okay. Now, I'm definitely not going to say they were perfect because a lot of the ingredients, it's hard to find them exactly as they deliver them to you. But regardless, uh, yeah, this is exactly what Blue Apron does for you. It actually tells you how to cook all this stuff and teaches you to some extent. And there are videos online of them making this stuff and doing all that as well. But uh, yeah, it, it's helpful. But I wouldn't say it's the right solution. I would say there is no difference between Blue Apron and just looking up a recipe and going and buying it. Okay. Well, technically, but the recipes they give you, it's not that crazy to just go do it yourself. And you mentioned something, and I see you going back over to put those uh, recipes away, but you have recipe books there. So I think recipe books are a little bit more um, believable, a little bit I would say hard fact than looking something up on the internet. And I'll give an example of this. I really enjoy grilling salmon. That's one of my normal meals, uh, seasoning it and then grilling it outside. And when I first started grilling salmon, this was, you know, fish is different than uh, chicken or beef or anything like that. So I looked up, I Googled, how long do you cook each side of salmon? Mm -hmm. And there were about 15 or 16 different times that I read on there. And it was all from different sites and everybody had their own different way and it was different recipes and all that stuff. So what I did is I went to a cooking book that I had, looked up in there, they had a single time and I followed that and I haven't been led wrong with that. But the times that I found on the internet were so varying. Some were like five minutes per side, some were 10 minutes per side. A couple of them were like, oh, you just lightly sear each side. And, and and again, I don't know which one's right out of all of those. And it could have been recipe specific, but I just wanted to know how long do you grill each side of salmon? And now cookbooks have a good starting point reference to kind of work your way from. But in my opinion, which, you know, is personal preference is just, you have to try it and maybe try it a couple different ways. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work perfectly the first time, you need to try a different recipe or so on and so forth. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree that. I uh, agree with that. That is what cooking is all about. It's trial and error. You're probably not going to find uh, the right way to do it the first time, but you shouldn't get discouraged and you should always try again. So you guys see me. I'm still back in the kitchen after those two terrible disasters that Greg and I have uh, described earlier, and I'm just getting better. Uh, now, I might not always cook um, gourmet meals every time. I, I'm a simple man. I like simple foods and simple things. Um, but I think that I like to experiment a little bit more, kind of branch out and try new things. All right, folks. So we've talked a little bit about our cooking, but now that we've given it some time to wait, we're actually going to fire up the devil boiler again and start making the actual brownie mix, I guess you could say, which basically is just a lot more chocolate. So we did four ounces the first time and we melted all that together. Now we're going to do 10 ounces. All right. Yep. And uh, let's, Greg's breaking up the chocolate right now. Do I need to turn the stove on? Yeah, get the back on. Okay. 
Aha! It worked. Again, I want to just say that that was my first time ever lighting a gas stove. Uh, so that could have gone terribly wrong. Yeah, it uh, but all exploded right here. That's the end of Broken Speaker. It's the end of Broken Speaker. Um, but <laughs> as you can tell, we are still recording, so my expert stove lighting skills are uh, why we're here today. Uh, but Greg's breaking up the 10 ounces of chocolate, and we're going to make the more of the brownie mix while the ganache... Freezes. Gan ganache is such a fun word to say. The ganache. The ganache. <laughs> This thing is like chocolate overload. So if you don't like chocolate, which I don't know who doesn't like chocolate, um, but this might not be for you, but I think Greg and I both enjoy chocolate. So this is going to be perfect. Well, that bar is already broken. Bit. All right, that looks good. So now, Brian, when you cook, do you just cook in normal clothes or do you want an apron? Um, I just cook in normal clothes. Do you, do you usually wear an apron? No. But everything gets really messy when I cook, so oh. I should get an apron. You, Greg, maybe that's your birthday present coming up, so. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, um, but yeah, no, it, it's actually interesting. I've thought about, about it before. So I, I equate cooking very much to brewing and home brewing because it's very similar. You have to keep different temperatures and stuff like that. But I've thought of a few times when I'm brewing because brewing does get very messy. It's a lot of a lot of cleanup afterwards. It's just work. You you have civilian clothes. You have work clothes. You yeah. want to protect your work clothes. So so I I thought about wearing my lab coat from back in college, a few times. Well, that would just make it like science. Well, I you know what and and it's kind of I, I feel like cooking can kind of be a science too, Me measuring things out. That's why I'm good at measuring things like the cream earlier. Um, All right. So the recipe here while we're melting that. So one of us. I'm I'm, 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 I'm stirring. And. On top of the butter that's going to melt, we're putting, I mean, on top of the chocolate that's going to melt, we're putting all of this butter in. Stick and a half of butter, essentially. So, all of that. I have found the face of diabetes, <laughs> and it is a bowl of butter and chocolate. Yes, all right. <laughs> so, Brian's going to melt that. Well, Brian's doing that. <laughs> I'm going to combine together eggs. And brown sugar with some vanilla extract. And then Grand Marnier, which I'm really excited to open and smell. You know, the better format for this podcast would have been to do a video to show you guys the panic and stress that goes into cooking. <laughs> uh, you guys can, yes, that's right. So I almost just dropped the pan full of butter and chocolate. Again, the end of this podcast. And I but, just smashed an egg in the carton. God yeah, dang so it. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff going on that would be very entertaining for you all to see. Um, but the important part is that we're trudging forward. And again, nothing's been broken yet, except for some eggs. And Okay, through the magic of editing and with a little bit of difficulty, it was kind of chaotic in the kitchen here. Brian and I have, uh, we finished up with the baking. We have a minute left on the chocolate lava cakes in the oven themselves. We made whipped cream in less than 10 minutes, yep. which was exciting. And we have everything ready to essentially decorate our cakes once we pull them out. But uh, in 30 seconds, we're going to pull them out and we're going to see if our cooking skills regardless of our pasts, have paid off with a wonderful treat that is chocolate lava cake. Absolutely. So uh, Greg's actually uh, cutting them up right now, but we have bought fresh strawberries and fresh blueberries uh, to go with our uh, chocolate lava cake and whipped cream. And I think it's kind of cool. We this, this entire thing, Greg, we bought from scratch or built from scratch. We did not buy even the whipped cream for this. And that's that is the that is the alarm for the oven. Greg's pulling them out right oh, now. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> oh wow, they actually look like chocolate lava cakes. Up, oh, they they jiggle a little bit. Do we need to go in longer? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Do you think we just let him sit and solidify? Yes. Yeah, we okay, do. so we're going to let him sit. Um, burning hot stove off my butt. <laughs> okay. So we're going to let him sit for a little while um, while we kind of get ready. Okay, Greg's giving me a thumbs up. <laughs> Looking good. He's So he's cutting around the edges of the ramekins. We're going to see how this goes. Anyways, we have to let him sit for a little bit longer. While Greg's doing that, because we have to let him sit for a little while to let him solidify, I'm just going to kind of go back to the beer uh, that I was been drinking throughout this entire process. So I chose to drink, like I said in the beginning, the Hef uh, from Frankenmuth Brewery, where Greg and I went to Frankenmuth uh, yesterday. Um, but uh, it's delicious. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, it has a very traditional German yeast taste to it. And uh, I really like that. So for those of you that don't really know, you've probably heard me talk about Belgian yeast um, before and the flavors that it will actually impart. German yeast is kind of a bready taste to it. Uh, and I really think that uh, it's not uh, used as often as I think it should be. So I think that's great. And I'm really excited about this. So if you are in um, Michigan or around Michigan, you should try out Frankenmuth Brewery. I enjoyed all their beers that they had there. And I really enjoyed this uh, Hefeweizen, the Hef. And you should check it out. There was a chocolate spill. Um, Greg's, Greg's working on it right now. It's, it got on the oven mitt. But he has saved the oven mitt. Um, you good, Greg? Everything is looking up. And is probably very delicious. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we're we're going to see. Uh, you know what? This has been an interesting experience. Five minutes while I figure all this out. And then we'll, we'll plate them. And we'll take pictures for a post. And we'll tell you just how delicious our chocolate lava cakes are. But right now I'm cutting up the strawberries. Now, here, let, I'm me, a let, me, let me cut up the strawberries. And you can talk a little bit. Okay. Um, well, we still need to do the, the blueberries, too. Okay, I, I can do I can do the fruit. All right, Brian's doing the fruit. <laughs> I am a firm believer in if it looks good, it tastes infinitely better. Now that's a personal preference, but I think uh, it gives good reason to plate things properly, put the time and effort into making them look good, and then you know, I guess Instagram your food, however you want to do that. But regardless, I'm going to talk about my Larry's latest sour ale. Now, because I have been running around in the kitchen, I feel like I made a mistake at the early beginning of the podcast saying that, of course, when everybody's baking or cooking, they're drinking beer, right? I didn't have time to finish my beer because <laughs> I was so uh, stressful, stressed out and running around and trying to get everything coordinated. So, yeah, it's good to have a beer and drink it while you're, while you're cooking or baking, but uh, it's kind of tough. Regardless, the Larry's latest sour ale is actually really good. It's a sour ale. It tastes sour, but it's fruity. It has a good aftertaste. I don't know. What do sour ales go with, Brian? Do you have an idea? Um, sour ales are going to go with anything with fruit in it. So it's, actually, I would say the sour ale will go with this a little bit. Uh, a lot of sour characteristics and flavors are going to come from uh, fruit. So the, one of the sours that I think of the most uh, is going to be La Folie uh, from New Belgium. And it has some raspberry characteristics to it. They also sell a Frambozen, which is a raspberry tart ale. But you think of tartness, fruit, when we talked about like Brewers Association, match same with same. Look for similarities. Fruit has, has tartness in it, whereas, you know, a uh, sour ale is a little bit tart. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of look at that and kind of add those together. That's what I would say, but I, I like sour, so I'm going to have to try that sometime because you enjoyed that. Yeah, I really did enjoy it. It's actually a really good uh, beer, and I think I would definitely enjoy having one of these on a summer day, sitting out in the, in the sun by a pool maybe, I don't know, have a, a sour ale. I think that's where I would enjoy this the most. Okay. We have the fruit, we have the plates, we have the ramekins. It's time to plate our chocolate lava cake. Now this one looked the most promising, right? Okay. Just so you guys know, we have four chances to get this right here, and the picture we're posting online will be the best one. Yep. Uh, so we, we won't be... We will definitely be editing for uh, correctness here. So Greg just flipped it over onto a plate. Oh, that worked. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my gosh! 
It looks beautiful. It's molten in the middle. All right, okay, okay. Okay, okay, this is actually working. Okay, before this messes up somehow, we got to take a picture of this. <laughs> Let's get the powdered sugar on here. Okay, putting a little bit of powdered sugar as a as a dressing. Yes. And then... Get the fruit? Oh, no. Oh, the whipped cream. The whipped cream. I'm going to push the whipped cream first. No, don't, don't. <laughs> Just leave. Yeah, the whipped cream. <clears throat> Put a dollop on the side or on top? Put it up the dollop on the side and the fruit on top of the whipped cream. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, one of these has worked perfectly. I think we have a success. We yes. we have I, I'm pretty sure we have a success right here. Okay. Alright. Um let's let's get let's get a picture of that. Let's uh, take that out to some light. Let's get some light on it and take a beautiful picture of our molten chocolate lava cake. This, ladies and gentlemen, I am thoroughly impressed with Greg and I, and, and I'm going to toot our own horns all the time for this, because this looks incredible, and uh, I cannot wait to bite into this. This is going to be awesome, so let's see if we can. Greg, you got a picture? Greg? All right, Brian, go grab a spoon. Okay, this we're going to grab yours. a spoon. Well, let's, let's, try to, let's try to make a second one before oh, we try. No. I want to try this at the same time, so we both can have... Uh, similar experiences and describe them to the podcast listener. So, pick the mo- second most promising one. The molten lava inside has fallen out on this one, but it's on the plate. It didn't spill over. I'd say it's a success. So, the one we took the picture of is the primo example. I think we had to butter our things a little, our, our ramekins a little bit better. But regardless, it looks delicious. And I'm going to plate this up real quick. Just like I did the other. Get the fruit. All right, and then you got a spoon. All right, so, so this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut into the cake, take a little bit of whipped cream. Or I'm going to take some whipped cream first, then cut into the cake. Just to have the cake and the whipped cream to begin with. you gotta, you got to dig into the cake and watch the molten lava fall out. Okay, that's what we'll do first. All right, go All ahead. Right. Ooh, that looks... It's molten in the inside. It's, it's basically gooey chocolate on the inside. It's gooey chocolate on the inside. And I just did the same for me, except for what spilled out. Yeah, it looks delicious. And let's okay. take a bite. See how this is. Mm-hmm. That tastes like a molten lava chocolate cake. Holy cow, we did it. We did it. High five. All right. Cool. <laughs> so, Brian, as we devour our delicious treat... What are your final thoughts on uh, our culinary episode and our wonderful adventure we had here? Well, you know, for our first culinary episode, I think this went pretty well. Had some fun times, drank some good beer, ended up with a delicious dessert. Um, I think that we definitely going to have to do a 2.0 of this. Yeah. But overall, I am impressed with what we were able to accomplish today. Because we've never made this before, and doing a live recording while we're doing this... This could have gone terribly wrong, but it worked. What about you, Greg? What's your uh, let's, what's your final thoughts on this? Brian forgot to do a cult of Amazon part. <laughs> so, and it's too late now. You can't do it now. <laughs> you passed your moment. That's my final thought. I've been waiting for this the whole episode. No, I'm just kidding. This is delicious. And <laughs> even if it didn't plate properly for mine, and yours is definitely the show, show, the show one, it is absolutely amazing. The whipped cream is good. The fresh fruit is good. The chocolate is just basically chocolate. You can't go wrong there. But it's got like a brownie on the outside and molten chocolate on the in. Oh, it is so good. So if you guys, uh, I think we'll put the recipe along with the podcast wherever, wherever we post it on YouTube and on our blog. So definitely take a look at the recipe. Give it a shot. I would say don't record a podcast while you're doing it because it makes it 10 times more difficult. But if you get the chance, I mean, go for it. Sure, whatever <laughs> works. So that's it, Brian. That's my uh, final thought. I think that's everything. So yeah, so thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, it's been a great podcast. It's been a great experiment. And uh, we will look for you next time at the next podcast episode. And see you from there. Bye. <laughs>